welcome. Today we are concluding our series, Every Good Tree. And our final sermon is on self-control. And here is our scripture. You should know this by now. Matthew 7, 16 to 20. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, today we need self-control. Lord, come into our hearts, just invade our lives and teach us how to say no to the things that will harm us, the things that will get in the way of our relationship with you, and also help us to say yes to the plans and purposes that you have for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Here are the verses that we will cover today. And as always, I encourage you to click on the underlying title of this sermon for the notes. We began our series, Every Good Tree, with love. Love is the seed of all of our fruit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness. Self-control is the glue that holds it all together. Self-control comes from a Greek word that literally means to be a master of self. Self-control is best illustrated by an Olympic athlete who gets up early every morning practices their sport, eats only certain things, and forgoes other pleasures of life, all for the chance at a gold medal. And here are a couple of examples. The first one is Michael Phelps. He was a four-time Olympian. He won 28 medals, 23 of them gold. He is the most decorated Olympian in history. He has more medals than 161 countries who have participated in the Olympics. He's retired now, but when he was in his top form, he practiced five to six hours a day, six days a week, swimming nearly 50 miles a week. He lifted weights, did push-ups, pull-ups, he ate up to 12,000 calories a day. And this is a quote from him. I think anything, everything is possible as long as you put your mind, work, and time into it. And that requires self-control. Our se second example is Simone Biles, and she's been to one Olympics. She was planning to go to this year's Olympics in Tokyo, but of course those have been canceled. So she has one Olympics. She's won five medals so far, four of them gold, plus 25 world champion medals. She is the most decorated gymnast in history. She trains six hours a day, six days a week. She also swims, runs, and rides bike and she is on a very strict diet and here's a quote from her make the goal about being better than you were yesterday rather than trying to be better than someone else was yesterday your greatest challenge more often than not is getting yourself to move getting yourself to act getting yourself to change, getting yourself to be focused and disciplined. Our biggest barrier is ourself. And that again 
that dedication of both Michael Phelps and Simone Biles requires self-control. An athlete's motivation to practice self-control is to become the best in their sport, so they pursue it with singular focus. Notice Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I am not like a boxer who misses his punches. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. We are to pursue self-control with the same fierceness, passion, drive, and singular focus as an athlete training for the Olympics because the prize we seek is of far greater value. We are not fighting for a gold medal. We are fighting for our eternal lives. We are fighting against something that is deeply rooted within us. And that thing is self. Self wants something and it wants it now. Self is personal, instantaneous gratification. Self is driven by fleshly desire. Self is proud, arrogant, confident, satisfied, indulgent, and it will not die without a fight. Paul tells us that we must actively and fiercely fight against self until it is dead. Notice what he says in Romans chapter 8. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Therefore, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are with not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pre pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we'll conclude that scripture in just a moment, but I want that to hang there for a second. Work out your salvation with fear and and trembling. The hardest fight we will ever fight is against ourselves. And I believe that that is what Paul is talking about here. 1 Timothy 6 
But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It is a fight, and it will be the most painful and vicious fight of your life. If you want to lose weight, you practice self-control by not going to the bakery. And it is an internal battle because I love, I love a good blueberry cake donut. If you want good grades, you practice self-control by studying and not playing video games. And again, that is an internal battle that you will fight. If you want to avoid a speeding ticket, you practice self-control by keeping to the speed limit. And I can tell you from personal experience that that is an internal battle because I love speed. I love it. There's nothing like driving down a road at 80, 90 miles an hour when there is nobody in sight. It's an internal battle. If you're an alcoholic and you don't want to drink, you practice self-control by not going to the bar. And that is an internal battle. And if you want to be full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, you practice self-control. And that is an internal battle because there will be days that you don't want to be patient. There will be days when you don't want to be kind. There will be days when you don't want to be faithful or have joy in your life. It takes self-control and it's an internal battle. Self-control will help us grow our personal relationship with Jesus and lay aside those things that will get in the way of that relationship. Without self-control, a person is driven by his or her own desires and not by God. And if that is the case, transformation will never happen. In Jesus, however, we have been given the power to say no to ourselves and yes to him. Notice Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Self-help is a popular concept. Have a problem? No problem. Read this book and all will be well. However, self-help books, and I have, I have a list. I went to Amazon and looked up some self-help books pertaining specifically to self-control. So here are some titles. Self-control, Mastering Your Passion, Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. The Now Habit, a strategic program for overcoming procrastination and enjoying guilt-free play. And finally, my favorite, The Marshmallow Test, Mastering Self-Control. However, these books will not help you master yourself, but self-control is meant to be the hallmark of the Christian life. It's not an optional extra. And unfortunately, we have no ability to manufacture self-control through human effort. So how do we become self-controlled people? by allowing the Holy Spirit into our lives to guide and transform them. Philippians chapter 2, Therefore, 
my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But Paul didn't stop there. Because if he had stopped there, the implication would be, you're on your own, buddy. But this is how he concludes the statement. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's God who does the work in us. We have to allow him to do it. And that's where the fight comes in. 2 Peter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who calls us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us a very great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. God has given us all the power we need. We just have to let him in so that that power, his power, becomes our power. The Holy Spirit will not automatically operate in the life of a Christian. A transformed life only happens as we surrender to and cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and that will be the toughest fight you will ever fight. Choosing the Holy Spirit is an absolute necessity for victorious Christian living because the power of a fruitful life does not lie with you and me. It lies with the Spirit. And according to Peter, that power gives us everything we need. An apple tree doesn't sit around trying to produce apples. An apple tree produces apples because it's an apple tree and it's planted in the ground. It's connected to its source of life. And so it is with the believer. A believer doesn't sit around trying to produce a righteous life. He produces a righteous life because he is a believer and because he's connected to his source of life. He's planted and deeply rooted in Jesus. I want, I want you to notice who does the work in these next few verses. Listen to who does the work here. Ezekiel 11. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. And Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Those two verses, sets of verses in Ezekiel, tell us clearly who's doing the work. It's God, and he's promised to do it. And finally, Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed formed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing 
and perfect will. Self-control is produced by God's work in us. It's a gift. And it is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, transforming us into the image of Jesus. For the last time, every good tree produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we desire to be people who produce good fruit. Not because we're trying to, but because you have so infused our lives that we simply do those things. We're not trying. We just simply are full of joy, full of peace, full of faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, love. We're full of those things. We become those sorts of people. But we can only do it when you have come into our hearts and you have promised that you are standing at the door of our heart and you are knocking, the thing that we have to do is let you in. So I pray, Lord, that all those who are listening to this will choose to let you in. To change and transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Next week, we will start a new series, and it's tentatively entitled Jesus and People. So stay tuned for that, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.